If you follow St Kilda, you will love Stephen Baker forever. If you follow any other club, the odds are you will have loathed him. Regardless, it's difficult not to admire the former Saint who would do whatever it took to play his role for his team. Welcome to Open Mic, Steve. Thanks, Mark. Really looking forward to this, mate. Me too, mate. I've been excited for a couple of days now. <laughs> this is supposed to be serious. Okay. You retired immediately after the 2011 elimination final loss to the Swans. Did you know you were retiring? Uh, not that night. I did by the end of the night mm. <laughs> when I was told, but um, it was a bit of a shock at the time. I hadn't really discussed it. You know, I knew I was sort of getting the flick halfway through the season and uh, I thought it was sort of... What do you mean? I had, a, I had a meeting with Ross and he said, you know, probably won't be needed next year. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> so I thought, oh, great, that's yeah, nice. And then, um, yeah, that night at the end of the game, basically, he said I'd retired and we hadn't really even discussed that. So mm. but I think he was just trying to, you know, look after me. You know. How is that looking after you? Well, not looking after me at such, but, um, you know, just... Giving me a good exit, I suppose. But, you were in your um, footy gear, weren't you? Yeah, yeah. I was. But um, just I think just trying to give me a good exit, and I just, you know, I'm an honest guy. I think I left the ground, and I just said, uh, I think I tweeted something. I was new on Twitter, and I said, I, um, yeah, haven't definitely haven't retired because I still <laughs> wanted to play on. You know, might have wanted to play somewhere else or something, and then yeah, got copped a bit of a little barrage from the club, saying, so, you know, why'd you do that? But no, I didn't really care. When when Ross left St Kilda and moved to Fremantle, did you resent the fact that someone who wasn't going to be there in 2012 had actually made your decision for you? Um, not really. I did. I, I still don't know to this day if it come from him or I think Chris Pelchin or mm. Pelican, whatever his, whatever his <laughs> name is. Um, yeah, I think he came in and then it seemed that I had a meeting with Ross a couple of days after that. So um, I don't know if it was his decision or Ross's, and um, so sort of I caught up with Ross at um, was at Lenny's wedding and. Um, he said, no, it wasn't him. Did he? Yeah, mm. so I, I still don't really know. But I didn't resent Ross. I got along with Ross really well. And he was always up front with me. And I respected the fact that he told me sort of mid-season. But it was just a bit of a shock that night. And, but you know, I didn't really, didn't really care. I just, you know, I don't like sort of telling, you know, porky pies. So I just yeah. come out and just basically said, no, I've got the arse. Do you know where you rank in, um, uh, in games played at St Kilda? No. You I've... played 203, as you would know that. You know, that's... the in the top 25 in the 115 year history of the footy club. Very impressive. Well it is, I mean you'd be, <laughs> I suspect you're probably as proud of that as you are of the sharing the, the best and fairest with Luke Ball in 2005. Um, yeah, the games played never sort of dawned on me that I'd even, I would never sort of aim to reach 200 and it was sort of my brother pulled me aside one day and said, you know, this is bloody amazing and, um, and then, you know, a couple of weeks out I thought, you know, this is going to be good. You sort of look at a bit of the history and um, sort of other people coming up to you remind you of it. And um, but when I got there, sort of, the Don Don, you a bit more, that was pretty special and um, you got up there with some big names. So it was, mm. it was something to look back on pretty proud now. Three grand finals, <clears throat> one draw, two losses. Are you scarred? Um, yeah, you've always got something churning in the guts. I wouldn't say scarred. I wasn't one to, you know, Take it to heart too much, but um, yeah, you always feel a little when you see him on the tally. You, you know, watch Collingwood, and you watch the highlights. Something little turns in your guts. Mm. I sort of get more anger than anything. Oh, you know, what could have been? But um, yeah, so I suppose you're always going to be scarred. Sort of, what if? You know, if we won, you mm. know, um, the sort of the memories that you would have had. But that's sort of you know, seeing Lenny after the game and the first one, sort of seeing your best mates cry and stuff. It was mm. a hard thing to do. So did you cry? I did have a tear in, I think it was the Geelong one. Mm. Um, I think it was, might have been Lenny that set me off. I mm. went over and saw him, how disappointed he was, and you know, sort of set me off a bit. So um, I think in the Collingwood one, I was, might have got used to the feeling, so I didn't, uh, mm. didn't cry. But uh, yeah, probably the first time and the last time I can remember him crying. So, Is there one thing in Stephen Baker's heart that if he could change, it might have made a difference in the game? I'm talking about you personally, not the bounce with Milne, but just in the game that you played, in the games that you played, Yep. Anything that you could have done differently that might have made a, a difference? Uh, well, I'm not sure. I think coming back sort of you know, after a bit of a bit of a break and then playing sort of my guts out the, the next week, I sort of felt like I probably shouldn't have played. Oh, my body was just feeling so bad. So we're talking 2010, correct? Yeah, the second granny after yep. the draw. That's yep. the one that um, I was, my body, I probably should have put the hand up and said, no, no good coach me. I had a break in my foot and I think... Did I'd, you I'd, really? Broken bone. Yeah, I had a break. Well, I snapped my second, I don't know what you call them, metacarpal, yeah, tarsal, yeah, yeah. tarsal. Or Sec tarsal, one of yeah, those. Yeah, I snapped the second one straight through. Um, still a bit of a mystery how that happened, but um, snapped it straight through and trained um, the next day, but then I had to get the operation, had a plate, come back for the uh, first granny, but then I 
put a little snap through the next toe in the first granny, but so I was just, I didn't know that at the time, but um, felt it in the first quarter in the second granny, and so I was getting sort of jabs quarter mm. time, half time in the foot, but I couldn't run, and I was sort of useless to the team in the second granny. And was that, was it the general fatigue too about having come back after sort of virtually three months out? Yeah, I never felt that feeling running on the first, in the first quarter, I think I was trying to chase bloody um, Pendlebury and couldn't catch up with him and I was blown after two minutes. I remember I was going to you know, try and give him a little cheap shot and then couldn't even <laughs> get with you. him. <laughs> yeah, not me. Couldn't even get within five metres of the bugger. So um, I thought, shit, if I can't, in the first five minutes on the ground, I can't chase someone down, I'm going to in for a long day and it, and it was. You missed 11 games through suspension and came straight back into a grand final. That suspension, lengthy by anyone's standards, occurred because of your running duel with uh, Stevie Johnson. Yeah. Uh, take us back to that day. I mean, that was a, an amazing day. I mean, you but it was virtually a free for all between you and Stevie J for two hours, wasn't it? Yeah, well, I um, I think because we had a good battle in the first granny it was you know, we both I think he held a bit of a grudge and you know I wanted to get him again and it was and it just and it just clashed and um, you know I I always the better the player the, the dirtier I am usually <laughs> so try and try and keep up with him or slow him down so you know, if and it started off a few little niggles and um, who started the niggling? Well, I started the niggling, mm -hmm. but um, he gave me a rip and punch. I don't know if it was a first or second, a big backhander. Mm -hmm. and I, think, I don't know if that's one where he broke his hand but in the game. But he gave me, gave yeah. me a rip and, rip and, rip and crack across mm -hmm. the forehead. And it wasn't caught on the camera. It was a sort of behind the goals vision of it. And I thought, oh, shit, that's a great one. It stumbled me a bit. And then I come in, the camera zoomed in just as I was giving him an uppercut straight after. So I thought, oh, shit, that's you know, got it done for retaliating. And then he come back on with the hand. I just, you know, cracking into his hand and I just didn't think much of it at the time. Mm. I thought, you know, it's just a bit of playful, playful fun. <laughs> um, trying to break his hand even more, but um, yeah, then he got me a ripper at the end. This is one of probably the best one I've copped mm. in my 12 years. What do you think now about the morality, for want of a better word, about targeting a player's injury in a game? Have you got any um, qualms about that? Well, obviously, I think it's OK. <laughs> but you did at the time, but I mean, yeah. I'm talking now reflectively. No, well, I think if you're on the ground, you, you know, you're, you're a target, mm -hmm. and you should be targeted if you've if you've got an injury. Like oh, it's a man's game, and I've sort of I've said it's been getting soft over the last four or five years. All these little rules, and they're changing the rules to bloody suit the umpires rather than the players, making mm -hmm. it easier to you know to meet out rather than making it a better game to watch. Mm -hmm. All these little hands in the back rules make me sick when they don't even move the player. That's, yeah. I find it hard to watch. Well, I'm, I'm with you on that one, but I'm talking about more about you seeing the Johnson hand, knowing it's it's injured or, or certainly sore. It's interesting because you... Uh, we, did you play in that game in Brisbane when uh, the Brisbane boys took off after Nick Revolt with the broken no, collarbone? I don't think I played that one. Oh. But I, I actually said the week after, I thought that was good play, targeting the, really? one of the... Yeah, so I you said... had no problems that they went after Nick? <clears throat> No. Well, maybe because yeah. he was coming off the ground, but he, if he was on the ground, I reckon he's fair game. Because he was coming off the ground, you know, it's a little bit... But I think if you're on the ground with an injury, like if someone's got a sore shoulder, you're going for hip and shoulder, you do it to your ease up. It's, I reckon it's mm. one of them grey areas that you know, it's going to be hard to get a perfect answer for. <laughs> I'm interested in your relationship with Stevie Johnson. Yep. I mean, superbly skilled player. He's one of my favourites, the way he plays. You seem to relish the task of playing on him. Um, but there was the bad blood that occurred during games. But this year, I heard a mate of mine at Geelong suggested that you sent Stevie J a message, and the PS to it was, "You've always been my favourite player." Is that true? <laughs> I think yeah. Well, I think it was a tweet. I um, I think it was more. I said about the hit that he gave me. I said that's the best hit I've ever had. And then at the end of that, I said, "PS, now you're my favourite player." Oh, now you're my favourite. Now player. you're my favourite yeah. player. Just because after that hit. Before that, I hated his guts. <laughs> Isn't it funny? You admired that in him, didn't you? I mean, the, the willingness, I think, to sort of say, OK, I'll cop it, but you're going to get one back? Yeah, well, I'd, I'd like the players that sort of get back into me and um, I was sort of respect it, I suppose, but he, gave, he probably gave more than I, I give that day. Even though I got the 12 weeks, um, he gave me a couple of ripping punches in the head and you know, I think he's just smarter getting it off camera. I come back with the, the retaliation and got, got done a few times. So. Now, you're a tough young man from uh, a tough area in Colac. I mean, you've would have grown up on the wet grounds, the wet muddy grounds up yeah. there. Then you go to the Geelong Falcons. <clears throat> Did you play the same sort of footy there? I presume there you were more of a free, free-flowing midfielder. But no, you weren't. <laughs> what, you weren't. What, what role did you play at the Falcons? Ah, uh, well, was on the bench most of the time for the <laughs> <laughs> for the first half of the season. I wasn't really getting a game, and I nearly quit. Uh, I talked to the old man. He talked me out of quitting in around 14, 15. You wanted um, to give footy away. Yeah, I wanted to give footy away. I was. 
you know, only playing just for the sake of it, really. I didn't really enjoy footy that much. I was a basketballer. Mm. Um, and then I think the coach came up to me and said, look, mate, what, you know, your skills are shit. What are you... You know, what are you doing? What can you do? And I said, I don't know. He, you know well, you're a good fighter. You know, what if we put you on this? <laughs> what if we put you on this um, player? Do you think you'd be able to stop him? Some peanut that was averaging you know, 40 touches. And <laughs> Does he have a name? I can't remember. I can't remember his name actually. Um, and yeah, went on him and just beat the shit out of him. And he came off the ground very sore and he had one or two kicks and come off. And, the, and he said, if I beat him, I'd get the game ball. You know, mm. I don't think I could even afford a footy at the time, so I was pumped. I got this footy and. And then that was when I got my role as a, t as a tagger yeah. and come up and I played three good games in the finals. Um, I think I was just, just scraped in to get into the Falcons. I don't think I would have just scraped in getting into St Kilda too, but it's worked out all right. Your appearances have changed a bit over the years. Just have a look at the monitor here, <laughs> oh, Steve. Shit. Just uh, see <laughs> if there are any memories here that, uh, that you like. <laughs> That's not me, is it? That's not you. <laughs> no, not. That's the undercut, isn't it? Yeah, I don't yeah, know. Was that done as a bet, mate, or not? <laughs> No, I actually just had long hair and I couldn't play footy with it, so uh, yeah, I had the undercut because I was, had a bit of a buff head. But what oh, about that like, one, mate? Is that you? <laughs> I knew you were like, <laughs> buffing this shit. Yeah, that's me. I think my sister wanted to, uh, wanted to be a hairdresser, so I had to let her have free reign, and yeah. Yeah, obviously, you're shit at it. <laughs> nice. nice. Do you think you'll revisit that one? <laughs> no, I don't think I'll go back to that one. That a, that's a Gary Crocker. <laughs> Steve, Tim Watson was your first Steve. coach at St Kilda. Yep. Uh, Rumour has it that. It was close to the point of where Tim was just going to say, look, on your bike, go home. You're not serious, you're not committed to football. Is that, is that true? Yeah, it was nearly my first and last coach. Um, I'd, it's good, probably because of the first training session was the, the um, problem. I missed it. So that was, uh, I nearly got the, the flick. I went out drinking. I was starstruck with big uh, Barry Hall and Aussie Jones and they were feeding me a few shots. And <laughs> we had a training session at, I think, 7 a.m., you know, meet the coach and whatnot. And, um, you know, all I can remember is being at the bar with the boys and then waking up and I was just wet as a shag in, in bed. I didn't, didn't know where I was and, and I was in the nude. I thought, like, yeah, the bed's what I'm going, what have I done here? Walked into another room, there was a, a girl screaming at me. I'm going, oh, I'm sorry, I don't know where I am. <laughs> um, you know, and she goes, I'm Barry's girlfriend. You know, he, he threw a bucket of water on you about three hours ago. Really? And yeah, I turned up to the club, I think it was about one o'clock that Arvo. And, um, what was the scheduled arrival time? Uh, 7 a.m. 7 a.m. That's so a fair was, miss, six hours. Yeah, I was late by a few hours, yeah. but um, yes, yeah, so I got put through a sort of a rigorous training for three or four hours and I was you know, throwing my guts up and then, yeah, Tim nearly sent me home. So it was Tim's day. arrival at St Kilda and your first official session? Yeah. Mm. So it wasn't a good start to the AFL and I, uh, I nearly got the flick the next day and um, yeah, I remember him saying, you know, you're on the back back on the first train to Colac and Ozzy, you're nearly back in the, uh, in the twos. So it was... Not a good start, and then I had that haircut, and he goes and get a get an effing haircut. So the mm. next day I had a shaved head, and I was a golden child for a couple of days. <laughs> for a day. yeah. yeah, I would have thought a colloque boy would have been more uh, better equipped to cope with a big drinking session than that. Yeah, I don't know. I was uh, yeah, got put put in my place pretty quick by mm. the uh, by the big fella. What age were you then? 18? 18, yeah. yeah, yeah. Blighty, Malcolm Blight. No one Did who's had any us, experience with Blighty <laughs> has doesn't have a story about him. What, what are your memories? Oh, not, a, not a lot. Did he coach us? Oh, he did for the whip, didn't he? Um, yeah, no, I remember him yelling at me and calling me... Uh, a, a, oh, I won't say what he called me, but because I, could, because I couldn't balk, I think he had put a whole session, he goes, now, you pick up the ball, you know, you're, you're allowed to dodge players, you know, Bakes, you don't have to you know, run head first into them, get tackled every time. And so he sort of belittled me in front of the group and you know, done a whole training session, got me out the front and maybe try and walk around him mm. and um, yeah, so he made fun of me a bit so I wasn't a big fan of uh, Blighty at the, knowing at the you, time. Knowing uh, you and knowing the way you played footy I mean, uh, Blighty at the front saying Bork, I suspect the Stephen Baker I know would have sort of said well no I can't Bork but cop this. <laughs> <laughs> that's, that's, what I felt like, that's what I felt like doing but um, yeah he wasn't, probably wasn't my favourite coach out of the four or five. Mm. Yeah. When you heard that he'd gone, do you remember what your gut reaction was? Um, just uh, yippee, I suppose. I was, was it? Yeah, yeah, I was happy to see the back of him. When do you think the penny dropped with you that if you wanted to be a league footballer, you had to change your ways? Um, probably, I don't know, just hanging out with Lenny Hayes, sort of turning my best mate pretty quick. Um, just seeing his professionalism and, you know, getting through training. And I was just getting, you know, the older I got, the sore I got. And if I didn't do the things that, you know, that you had to do to be a footballer, I couldn't get, couldn't get through a game. And 
Um, so it sort of was a slow progression. I might have, I might have dragged Lenny down a few pegs and <laughs> he, he brought me up a few. Um, you lived with Lenny, didn't you? Yeah, I lived with him for, for a while. Mm. So that was good. So, so you took out, it was just the application thing that Lenny had, the work ethic. Yeah, just, yeah. A, just a pure professionalism and you know, I sort of gradually got it. We need to finish uh, the coaches. Grant Thomas. Um, what do you remember to <laughs> Tomo? No, good memories, positive person, you know, just inspiring. I'm still good mates to this day, so still catch up for a quiet beer occasionally. Um, and yeah, I was sad to see him leave. You went out with his daughter for <laughs> some time, <laughs> didn't did you? Bring not? that up. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I think that was a. Was he, was a, did the relationship change when he was the prospective father Yeah, the relationship sort of dwindled a little bit for, <laughs> for six months there and I, you know, I think we had a bit of a kiss one night and then, you know, I ended Did up... you and Tomo or you and his no, daughter? No, me and his daughter and, yeah. and then I, yeah, I said, Tom, I really like your daughter and he's just, the, yeah, <laughs> stared right through me and, yeah, we didn't talk for a while and I was too gutless to um, face him again so we had a little bit of a relationship outside um, his mm. well, knowing. For, for how long? Uh, a couple of months. I've got some news for you, mate. He knew. <laughs> Did he? Yeah, he knew. Oh, I told him, but then, yeah, then it was... I just didn't go to his house and the relationship wasn't uh, yeah, going along very well. <laughs> Your Wikipedia entry says, he, that's you, used a variety of tactics to prevent his opponent from getting the ball, including standing on their feet and repeated hits to the arm. Correct? <laughs> Among yeah. others. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Who writes that? Yeah. What was your preferred tactic? What was... You played on lots of big names in, in your role. Yeah. Which was the tactic that you would resort to when you needed something negative most? Um, well, I, yeah, the punch in the back of the arm one I love. Mm. So I remember I, get a, I got hit there one day and it gave me a dead arm for the rest of the game and I couldn't move properly. So that was one I used to work on. I just to hit him just above the elbow and mm. just constantly all day in the same spot. Mm. Um, I've got a few players that actually went off because their arm was, arm was too sore. Um, you know, when they're kicking and mark, they seem to drop marks when you do that. Yeah, yeah. Um, I had, the, had me stops sharpened a couple of times. The Did boys still really? laugh about that. I used to yeah. file them a bit sharper and then stand on their ankles. I used to know the good spot to hit them in the guts. Sternum? Yeah, the sternum. Yeah. And just as the ball's getting, just give them a little one in the sternum. Mm. You know, it takes the wind out of you. And, um, yeah, that was, that was some of the favourites. But it's a reasonable array of uh, yeah. <laughs> defensive tactics. And I had the old, um, you know, the backwards headbutt used to be, and you went on, you were behind. Yeah, give him a bit of right a, back. Yeah. Yeah. My memory says that uh, you actually got into Juddie's head when he was at West Coast, wasn't he? And uh, he got reported for smacking you? Yeah, he, um, he got me a ripper, a bit of a backwards elbow. Mm. So I think uh, you know, I was being a bit of annoying. I would have whacked me too that day, so... <laughs> you would have whacked yourself. <laughs> yeah, I was being a bit annoying, so... Um, yeah, I deserve that, but he got me a good one, dropped me to my knees. Did that change your view of him? Yeah, he was my favourite player for a while until uh, <laughs> until Stevie. You like gave all me. these blokes you bash up? Yeah, but um, yeah, Stevie gave me a better one. So did he? Okay, yeah. okay. Now, not surprisingly, the umpires didn't seem to appreciate your talents all that much. Four Brownlow votes in two hundred and three games. Yeah, one in the year in which you won the best and fairest. Yeah, and I had an asterisk because I couldn't win it anyway. <laughs> <laughs> so you played dead, did you? Yeah. yeah. So. You played on uh, some big guns during your time. Scotty West, Brad Johnson, Stevie Johnson, Chris Yard, Jeff Farmer, Kane Johnson, Gary Ablett. Who was the most difficult opponent? Um, I think I've said in the past that's Gary and Juddy. Um, mm. Gary, I used to have the wood over him early days and I used to sort of clean him up, but then sort of later... You know, he was, uh, the last game we played, he had over, over 30. And not many players would get over 30 on me. And um, I think my career was winding down a bit and his was uh, winding mm. up. So, you know, I think I used to get the better of him when he was, you know, playing on the forward flank and that. But then if I played him the, in the last couple of years, he would have sliced me to pieces. And you know, Juddy, he's just, he was a machine. Just aerobically, I couldn't, keep, I couldn't keep up. You know, I'd have to do every tactic under the sun to stop him at, you know, the little punches and getting in his road and chopping, trying and stop his run because he got a meter on me. He was, you know, he was out of there. So it was just the concentration on them players. You know, everyone thinks it's, it's physical and mm. stuff, but the concentration, just what are they doing, which way are they going, was you know, with Jardy and Ablett there. That's one thing you got to look at all the time. After the break, you and the tribunal. In your role to try to win a game of football, anything? Um, oh, obviously, there's a lot of things. I, I never really done a king hit or anything mm. like nothing totally out of the um, yeah out of the rule book. But 
you know, try and get away with what I could inside the rules when the umpire wasn't inside watching. Inside the rules? <laughs> like punching a bloke. Well, trying to um, get away with things, you know, so I didn't get caught. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But, you know, I remember I used to have a rule, uh, thing and I used to drop players after they'd handball the ball, I used to grab them and drop them. And I think they changed that rule. Now it's 50 metres, mm -hmm. you do that. So, mm. so I like to think I changed a few rules in, uh, <laughs> in my time, which uh, leave, left my mark on the game a little bit. That was to drop them to hurt them, like arms pinned? Oh, no, just once I get the handball, I used to think you might as well drop them because if it's a free kick, it's going to slow the play mm. down. Give, mm. give your teammates time to get back, and I was doing that for a couple of years, and thought it was great. And yeah, then they changed that rule. Now it's 50 metres. So, yeah. Jeff Farmer cost you seven weeks once. Yeah, and there was no vision. What happened? Um, it was an incidental, <laughs> accidental, <laughs> deliberate. <laughs> uh, yeah, it was a bit of a headbutt. We were just running down the wing and found myself in <laughs> the wrong position. And uh, yeah, so were you up. coming in, in opposite directions? Oh, I can't remember what I said at the tribunal, but um, yeah, it was a bit of a, I was a bit of stop and prop and... Okay, and through the head back or forward? Um, back. Yeah. So you, it was intended? Oh, I tried to stop him, Yeah. but yeah, I didn't think I'd get him that good. Mm. What, how, how did they rub you out with that um, film? Oh, that? I think it was the bad legal advice I told the what happened. I said, look, I stopped and propped, and they said, oh, well, you, know, you can't get done for that. You, mm. You're stopping someone's path, but then, you know, it was... The conclusion was I caused the um, contact and it was mm. high, so it was points, um, and it was hard, it was severe because he broke his face pretty bad. So mm. um, yeah, it was. I got told to say that in the tribunal, so obviously, you know, went in there and I think even if I didn't say that, would have found a way to get me anyway. They would have, mm. yeah, you know, found someone in the crowd that said they saw yeah, it or yeah, something, yeah, and they yeah. would they would have rubbed me out or yeah. So I don't think it would have mattered. Mm. What I said, I could have went in there in the nude and <laughs> threw bloody pies at him, and <laughs> it wouldn't have mattered. Within the same outcome. Of the 40 most reported players in the history of the game, you're the only one with a 100% guilty record. 15 charges, 15 suspensions. Is that because it was S Baker each time, or? or oh, I, I, I come to that opinion a couple of times. I got charged. I think I got charged two weeks for attempted striking on. Um, another one, I had a bloke standing on my foot and I've kicked his foot off and get three weeks for mm. you know, 110 kilo guys standing on my ankle. Who, who was that? I think it was Alessio. Yeah. He was standing on my ankle and I just brushed him off with my other foot. It wasn't a kick or anything and got three weeks for that. And then obviously the farmer one. So I always sort of felt like I was doomed before I even went in there. Mm. Like going to their meetings, I'd sit in there for five hours listening to some QC. I'm going, this is, this is a waste of time. You know, I'd rather be home. Bloody Sitting on the couch, and because I know the know the outcome before I go in there. So why? Why? Because it was you. Yeah. Well, that's well, that's the way I felt. I probably they probably thinking, you know, oh, poor Stevie Baker. But that's the way I felt. I felt mm. like I was going in there, and I'd get the script, and it was just the same result every time. Do you, the script? You mean? Do you think things were pre uh, predetermined oh, just, or not? No, I'll just. Well, my script in seeing what I was going to say and you know, how I was going to defend oh, myself. Yeah, yeah, but yeah. but I th I felt like it was you know they were. Whoever was on the bench, I think I tweeted something the other day that they were just like puppets. Puppets for whom? Who was pulling the oh. strings? <laughs> well, I think I said in my tweet the AFL. I think it said oh, the really? AFL. Uh, yeah. Do you think that, that, that consider this because it's a it's a fairly big claim? Do you think that there's interference from the AFL in the determinations of the match review panel and the tribunal? Oh, I felt there was. I felt there would have been for sure. I thought, yeah, let's let's rub this little bugger out and let's see how good players play. That's the way I sort of. Mm. When I've walked away you know, from many a tribunal hearings, when I thought, you know, I'll get off or I'll, I'll get five weeks and I'll get 12 or something, I, was, I sort of felt like it was, you know, I don't usually like to complain, but um, it just felt sort of unfair sometimes. Because you are a despised race, aren't you? The people, the run with players, the taggers, whatever term we want to use. Mm. I think the media, the authorities all sort of say, well, the game's better without them. Do you agree with that? Oh, definitely. I think, you know, the AFL like to see their good players on the park and getting 30, 40 touches when they get, you know, five or ten touches. And then they go, oh, yeah, it's a big, massive talking point. Mm. You know, taggers should be scrapped and get taggers out of the game. I remember there have been headlines many a times mm. you know, about it. Um, when, you, when you do a good job on someone, but, you know, it's, they've got to think we've got a job. You know, we get told to do that, so... I mentioned some of your regular opponents before, one of whom was Kane Johnson. I was at Eddie Head one day. <laughs> Do you know where I'm going with this? Yeah, I think I remember. Was it that one. quarter time break? Or three quarter it was a break, wasn't it? Yeah, it might have been just before the break, was it? Yeah. You and you just took off after him. As if he'd st stolen your wallet or 
something worse. Yeah, yeah I remember that incident. I, um, I think I was just at a stoppage and he came up, I was tagging someone else, I can't remember who exactly, uh, the memory again, and he came up and elbowed me in the back of the neck and... Can't have that, can we? Basically ran, I, and I went to my knees and <clears throat> looked up and just saw his number and, and saw red and chased him down. And, mm. And at, at the time, I just went up. I don't know what I was thinking. I just went up to remonstrate and you know, give him a bit of a yeah, and ended up throwing the fist. 203 games and three grand finals and a best and fairest, and I think a second or third in another. So you've paid your dues, there's no doubt about that. How do you look back on what Stephen Baker did in his footy career? Um, I don't know. I suppose I'm one word proud when I look back on what I've done. Um, when someone says, you know, you want a BNF, you say, oh, shit, yeah, I actually did, you know. You know, drew, drew the BNF, but um, and then the 203 games, the more you know, you're out of the game, the sort of more oh shit, that's actually pretty special. Mm. Seen some other players do it, and um, yeah, so I'd probably be proud of it mm. after the fact. You're now playing at Craigie Burn. Don't tell me you're tagging out there, are you? Um, I have a couple of games, <laughs> have a couple of games, but yeah, it's not as not as strict tagging. But uh, back flank and then sort of running running on the ball, played forward on the weekend. Snagged one in the first quarter, so but then I got moved back when they uh, when they kicked the couple. Now you lost your father a few months ago. Yep. Um, it uh, reminded me when I heard that news of uh, your father at um, Footy Park in Adelaide <laughs> one year. Yeah. Now this is I don't know whether it's fact or fiction, but um, Fraser Gehrig was on fire, kicked his hundredth goal in a in a final at Footy Park, and the St Kilda hordes invaded the field led by your father. Is that true? It's a true story. I think I got, yeah, I think the whole crowd was going over to Fraser or whatever, and then I got a pat on the ass, and um, and Lenny, I think Lenny was near me, and the old man Greggy, he's saying, get a, he said, get an effing kick, boys, and, he's, and I was saying he's run, run off with a big smile on his face, and I think he had a few whiskeys on the on the way to the ground, and, and then um, and then he drove back all through the night and um, got back to my sister's netball grand final the next day, and got in a leotard and done a run at half time on the old netball court, so it was a Gee, the character. The apple hasn't fallen far from the tree, has it? No, I think that's why I got that trait. He didn't really think about consequences and stuff too much, so it's uh, something he's handed down. Your father's gone from Melbourne to Adelaide to watch a game of footy. Obviously, a pretty strong relationship between the two yeah. of them. Yeah, you trying to make me cry on television? <laughs> <laughs> that's what you're trying to do, you <laughs> <laughs> So I can't call you arsehole. Um, yeah, no, very strong. He used to come to every game and give us a hug after every game, mm. so he's. Yeah. And this, it's emotional for all of us, mate. We've only got one father. I keep telling my kids that. But, uh, <laughs> it is. but I mean, I, I just knew from the outside that, that there was this a very strong relationship, and I'll leave it there because, mate, I don't want a tough guy like Stevie Baker <laughs> yeah, shedding you're tears. I know you're trying, I know you're trying to do I think I'm prepared for that one. Well, look, I, no doubt about this. I, there's no question that you got the best out of yourself uh, and you gave a heap to the footy club. It was a rocky start, obviously. But uh, I think you're entitled to be in, uh, really proud of what you've done and what you've contributed, and I'm sure now that when you see those folks that you made life misery for for so long, <laughs> you'd love to have a beer with them and just share the footy memory. So thank you for sharing them with us, and good luck for the future, Stevie. Thanks, Mickey. <laughs> Pleasure. <laughs> <laughs>